Hello, everyone, and welcome to our show. Today, we discuss about analytics and customer development, how you can retain your audience, uh, sell more, uh, and uh, create the feeling of loyalty because many brands are looking for this ways because we know that today it's much simpler to sell to existing customers than to acquire new ones. According to a few studies, uh, it costs five times less if you uh, retain your audience. And I'm excited to discuss this topic with Kevin Hillstrom. How are you? I am happy today. How are you? <laughs> uh, I'm always happy. I think, you know, happiness depends on your uh, mindset. If you set up the right po positive mindset, when you wake up, everything will be fine. You know? <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> okay. Before we start, just tell more about your experience, background, and why you decided to share about uh, customer development with us. So my background um, is I'm a statistician. So I love doing statistics, love playing with math. Um, I spent 20 years working in um, retail, so like actual physical stores, analyzing how customers behaved. And uh, after doing that for 20 years and working with executives, I felt like I wanted to uh, start my own business and work with a lot more clients and see a lot more problems. So I have uh, had my own consultancy now for 15 years and I help anywhere from small e-commerce brands that might be maybe have $5 million in annual sales up to billion dollar retailers understand how their customers are behaving and how customers interact with the products that those companies are selling. And so mm -hmm. in the process of doing that over 15 years, I've developed a framework. I call it customer development. It's, it's a framework that helps me understand how good of a job a company does at taking a new customer and eventually having that customer become a loyal customer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love it, love it. Uh, we have a sponsor today, Ahrefs SEO tools and resources to grow your search traffic, you know. So if you are serious about SEO game, it's a must have tool, you know, uh, like Google Analytics, Search Console, but it's paid tool, uh, but you know, you can get a lot of valuable insights. I have uh, the first question for you. Can you tell, uh, you mentioned that you cooperate with uh, big companies, you know, to provide this consultancy. Uh, can you tell uh, what kind of help can you give big companies if they have own resources, uh, own uh, experts who can lead them in the right direction? How you can uh, show another way of retaining customers uh, and uh, yeah, to provide more insights with that? So most of my large clients would have very large analytics teams. They, they have many analysts. They, they, they would have the traditional marketing analysts. They'll have an SEO analyst. They've got their uh, paid social analysts. They have their display analysts. And those people perform marketing functions and do analytics. So all of those individuals, if you think about it, are really dealing with how do I get a customer to buy something today? And so mm -hmm. they're, they're working in real time to get customers to buy something on the site right now. And my job is to step as far away from that as I possibly can. So I, I am not trying to help them accomplish those tasks. They already have experts to do that. They already have agencies they work with, and they're quite good at it for the most part. So where I come in is, um, say you uh, acquired a customer through SEO. Mm -hmm. That customer now has just bought from you. My job is to work with the email marketing team, to work with the vice president of marketing, to work with the chief financial officer, to show them how that customer is going to change and develop over time. So mm -hmm. what I find is for most of my clients, customers have a very common rhythm. All right. So when a customer buys from you for the first time, that customer is very likely to buy again in the next 30 to 90 days. And mm -hmm. most of my large clients kind of intuitively know this, but they don't really act upon it. So they mm -hmm. have an email marketing program. And if they have the email marketing address for that customer, they will go ahead and send them campaigns every day. But they're not doing anything special to help that customer get over the hump and buy it for a second time. Mm -hmm. Once that customer buys for a second time, that customer is starting the process. I call it emergence. That customer is beginning the process of becoming a loyal customer. It's still going to take another three or four purchases for that customer to become loyal. But my job is to basically show my clients what are the inflection points when that customer is likely to buy again. And probably more importantly, what 
products or merchandise is that customer likely to purchase so that they know mm -hmm. what the future for that customer. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell more about personalization with email marketing? Uh, how to personalize the message, the right message? Because uh, uh, I check out a few studies that people usually get uh, plus 100 emails a day. It's hard, you know, to uh, read all these emails and they usually uh, don't do it. You know, <laughs> only 8% of all emails are opened and most of them are from uh, customers, friends, colleagues, but not from uh, some propositions. Can you tell how to personalize the message uh, to your uh, to existing customers and to get some valuable insights with that? Because most people are not willing to buy. You need to give them a strong reason to buy uh, the second time. So most of my clients would have some sort of personalization algorithm. Um, either they built it in-house or they work with third parties to implement it. And it's much more um, important to message the products that that customer is likely to buy next versus to have the actual message be the driving force. So mm -hmm. what I mean by that is um, if you, for instance, if you just purchased a new vehicle, you bought a new car, um, you don't need a new car again for several years. So you, the, what you would feature in an email marketing campaign or maybe the services you provide like oil changes um, or car repair or something like that, maybe uh, floor mats in the car so you can you know, feed our resting on that. Um, you're going to feature products that are complementary to what the customer just purchased. And mm -hmm. that is really what I'm trying to help my clients with is I'm trying to help them say that the customer who bought this shirt on a first order is going to be mm -hmm. likely to buy a pair of pants. And therefore, these are the pants that you should feature to customers who just bought this shirt. And so for, for most of my clients, that's worth a 20% to 50% increase in pro probability of buying over the course of the next week to month. And nice. so, and, and we're not really looking at whether it's important that the customer buy something tomorrow, we're, we're basically trying to create a scenario where we are encouraging a customer to buy again over the next 30 to 90 days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love it, love it. Uh, can you tell how to learn customers today? For example, uh, I see when brands usually rely on online studies or tools, the average data, but I think each case is different. Customers are different. Can you tell your uh, techniques how to learn customers? For example, if you have a new client, a big client with a loyal audience, customers, how to start learning uh, what customers want to get uh, to consider in your marketing message? Um. I deal with, I guess, what I would call first party data. So I'm, I'm really looking at what a customer purchased. Mm -hmm. And based off of what a customer purchased, I, I started with their first order. The first time they buy, I look at what they bought. Based on what they bought, I put them into a cohort. So a mm -hmm. customer that bought through um, paid social and bought a uh, men's top is into one cohort. And I basically come up with a series of cohorts and I follow those cohorts over time. And that helps me provide something for my clients that's above and beyond what they normally do with their internal or their in-house teams or with their agencies. And those cohorts of customers tend to be very predictive. So the mm -hmm. customer who buys through paid social and buys this men's top is going to have very consistent behavior over the next couple of years. And because the behavior is predictable, we can figure out when we should market to the customer and what we, sh we should share with them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Uh, can you tell uh, about uh, analytics tools that you use uh, to learn customers? So I am um, very old school in how I approach this. I use IBM's SPSS statistical package because I've used mm -hmm. it for 35 years. So I, <laughs> most of my clients are sending me um, uh, comma separated files, basically. So that's, if you think about it just as a spreadsheet. Um, it might have a billion rows in it, but that's what they're sending. Each row has uh, one, there's one row for every item the customer has purchased in their lifetime. And the columns determine something about what that customer did on that order. So it tells you what marketing channel they bought from, tells you what merchandise category they bought from, what day they bought, how much they spent, the quantity, et cetera. I take all that, put it into about 8,500 lines of code that I have created. And the code mm -hmm. spits out a bunch of high level metrics for me that tell me what the dynamics are for that business and how that business is unique and different from the other ones I work with. It also gives me an idea which 
former clients are kind of similar. So I have a, a, a background that I can use to determine how I might want to make recommendations for that client. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why not? Yeah, uh, if it works, you know, why not? I think, you know, uh, all tools have advantages and disadvantages and Microsoft is a great tool. Why not? So, yeah, if it provides uh, valuable insights. Uh, I'm interested about uh, creating the feeling of uh, customer loyalty. Uh, once I read a book that customer loyalty is, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's like a myth because uh, uh, customers are loyal because uh, you have much better products than your competitors have. If your competitors can provide uh, some unique selling proposition with better uh, features, you know, they will go to your competitor because it's not a dog. If you buy a dog, you, yeah, you have the sell loyalty. A dog can't change uh, the owner, but uh, customers can, you know, they're human beings. They have choices. Can you tell how to build customer loyalty? Uh, what uh, kind of methods to use uh, to create this feeling? So when I work with a client, I mm -hmm. map out for every 100 customers you acquire, how many are going to become loyal. Mm -hmm. And for, on average for my clients, across all the clients I work with, for every 100 customers you acquire, only 10 of them are going to become loyal. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of your customers, probably 60 of them are never going to buy again. They just fall away. And then of the remaining 40, 10 of them become loyal. The other 30 just kind of, you know, buy once or twice a year at most, and they never, ever achieve loyalty. So there mm -hmm. are several things that my clients focus on then. Um, so one of them is you look at key points in time when a customer is likely to buy something. So uh, if I acquired a customer in December around Christmas, that customer is going to be active for about 30 days. And then that customer becomes inactive for about 10 months. And then that customer becomes active again around Christmas the following year. So that's a customer who's probably not going to become very loyal. And your job is to just make sure you get revenue from that customer around Christmas every year, if possible. Mm -hmm. If that customer buys for the first time, let's say in March, that customer is going to be very likely to buy in the next 90 days. If you can get that customer to buy again, and if you can get the customer to buy from different product categories, then you have a better chance of the customer becoming loyal. If you can get, by, get the customer to buy two or three or four items, the customer has a better chance of becoming loyal. So mm -hmm. the, the concept of more is, is, is how I like to think about that. You want them to buy from more product categories. You want them to buy from more times of the year, and you want them to buy more items per order than an average customer. So you want to cross sell and upsell that customer. If you can accomplish that concept of more, the customer becomes more likely to purchase again in the future. And eventually the customer does become loyal. Even mm -hmm. when the customer becomes loyal, the customer doesn't stay with you. So in my projects, I determine, I, I, I tell my clients that a customer is loyal if the customer has bought about four times and has a 60% chance of buying again in the next year. So even though mm -hmm. that customer is kind of loyal, the customer still has a pretty good chance of defecting and not coming back again. Mm -hmm. So what I try to do is try to get that customer to do more things and do Sorry, more things quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think you have Alexa, yeah? Or Siri, I don't know. That was Siri, <laughs> yes. <laughs> ah, Siri, got it. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I found on your LinkedIn profile that you have 14 years uh, running a consulting practice with uh, 250 plus global uh, clients. It's a lot. Can you tell how do you schedule your time, you know, to uh, serve uh, to all your clients? Because uh, I, uh, you have a lot of clients, you have uh, huge experience. Uh, I'm interested about uh, priorities, uh, how to choose your time, schedule it, because if someone uh, from my audience want to jump on this field to help others support them, uh, can you lead them in the right direction how to schedule this time uh, between uh, your clients? So I've kind of developed this over the last 15 years and it's pretty consistent. Uh, about 70% of my clients come from my blog. So they mm -hmm. are, I have about 1,400 email subscribers to my blog. I have a few, another couple hundred through RSS. So somewhere around 1,500 to 1,600 subscribers to my blog. I write my blog every day. I schedule mm -hmm. them out over 
time, but um, there, there's basically a post every single day. Um, and 70% of my projects come from people reading that. Um, it typically takes between six and 24 months for a new subscriber to trust me enough to hire me. So it's something mm -hmm. that's long -term, uh, a long-term relationship. So I'm basically spending a half hour to an hour a day writing blog posts. Mm -hmm. um, I have a presence on Twitter, which is where I kind of throw out ideas to see what people just think that they hate them or like, you know, if they like them. Um, that doesn't take a lot of time at all. Um, I work on two large projects per month. So, mm -hmm. that's, so that means I'm going to have 24 projects per year. And I will not work on more than two at a time um, unless the client somehow sends data late or something like that. But on average, I'm trying to schedule for two projects per month. So I'm probably spending 30 hours a week working on those kind of projects. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I make sure that about 25% of my time is spent developing new ideas. So either through the blog um, or writing articles for the blog or writing booklets, about 20% of my business comes from small little booklets that I write. Um, they're maybe 40 to 60 pages long and they kind of do a minute, mini dive into um, a topic. Um, that's, it's not a topic that's worth 200 pages for a whole book, but it's, it's worth a small amount of pages, but it's more than a blog post. Um, that's mm -hmm. worth about 20% of my projects those booklets become the projects that I eventually sell to clients. And so I spend a good, you know, five to 10 hours a week working on that kind of stuff as well. So mm -hmm. if you add that all together, I'm basically spending 75% of my time on project work, 25% of my time on developing clients, blog posts, booklets, that kind of thing. So it's a 75, 25 mix. Uh, I love your consistency and discipline, you know, because <laughs> I think, uh, 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 when bloggers want to achieve high results, and uh, I remember when in one study, uh, I got the number that 50% of bloggers don't write the second blog post, you know, because uh, they can't get results from the first. And guys, you can see that Kevin can uh, uh, do it each day, you know, and yeah, I think it's consistency. It helps to improve your quality as well. Can you tell more about how to find ideas to post every single day? I know Seb Godin uh, posts every single day on his post. Uh, I usually do it on my social media because uh, I pay more attention, uh, you know, to uh, grow on social media. Can you tell about your blog? Uh, how you can find a lot of ideas because uh, I'm not sure it's uh, simple, you know, to post every single day some new ideas on blog. So a lot of my ideas um, come from, I, I subscribe to newsletters in my industry. So since I'm helping retail brands and e-commerce brands, I subscribe to um, industry newsletters. I have... Um, maybe 30 or 40 different people on Twitter that I follow. And they, what I kind of do is I, I, I look for themes. So, you know, the, in, in the past six months or so, people have talked a lot about inflation and, you know, the prices are increasing. So what I will see in across all these different themes that I'm looking at are price, um, business people are debating whether they should increase their prices. When they mm -hmm. increase the prices, they talk about, you know, sales seem, you know, a little slow. We, you know, what is it? Is it the economy? Is it that we raise prices? We don't know. Is it, it, it just seems like, you know, there are all these external factors and our, our ability to sell is being compromised. If I start to see that theme come up across seven or eight different people, I go into my data sets for the clients I'm working on. And I try to test the hypotheses that I'm hearing out in the public. And if mm -hmm. I can see that there is something to that, I have different data sets I use to create products. And so I will then create a product about prices. So mm -hmm. working on a project for a client now, I'm going to have 2,000 lines of code that tell me if you increase his prices by this much, you decrease response by this much. And I'm able to give that to my clients that is part of a normal project because I sense that it's going to be important based on what I'm reading. So mm -hmm. I'm always looking at what other people are saying and then testing their hypotheses with the data that I have available to me. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Uh, can you tell more about testing? Uh, how to provide this approach? Uh, because, you know, I think testing takes some time, uh, uh, various methods, and you can find... Uh, 
method that works much better than any others. Can you tell uh, your methods of testing uh, with pricing, with uh, any proposition for customers? So testing, meaning like um, testing one thing versus another thing to see which gives you better response? Yes. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for most of my clients, we, we execute pretty simple A-B tests. So in other words, we test a hypothesis versus our control. And we will test that for until we get X number of responses or X number of visits or whatever. Um, I like that this is sound kind of weird, but I, I like doing what are called factorial tests. So a factorial test is um, let's let's do it this way. Um, let's say we we send email campaigns versus we don't send email campaigns, and then at the same time we either execute paid search campaigns in certain markets and we don't execute paid search campaigns in other markets. That would be called a two by two factorial design. And it allows me then to figure out the impact of email marketing on paid search. It allows me to see the impact of paid search on email marketing. And it allows me to see if you do a more marketing, do you get more return on your investment and generate more profit? I tend to like factorial designs because they allow me to learn more things about how a customer is behaving. And my job is really to teach what to teach my clients what is happening. So I want them to learn as much as possible. And I don't want them to learn it in a vacuum. What I don't want to see is um, you execute a search test. And then the client says, well, we're also doing email marketing. What does that do? And then I have to go and execute another test. So I like to layer my tests on top of each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, can you tell about uh, creating brand awareness? Uh, how uh, such method can help to retain customers? Do you help your uh, customers, you know, to uh, create brand awareness uh, and to build this uh, customer's loyalty? So I tell my clients it's important. I don't necessarily help them with that because I don't feel I'm good at that. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I'm good with numbers and mm -hmm. this, this is just a personal belief. So I'm not saying that I have data to prove this. Um, I think you're either good at numbers or you're good at being creative. And, mm -hmm. and what I mean by being creative is um, cr creative would be to create a brand proposition that somebody who's never bought from you finds appealing and then decides that they are going to purchase from you. So you'll mm -hmm. see you know, a, 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 an Android phone has a value proposition that's different than an iPhone. And it takes Google a decade to basically teach enough customers that this is a, dif a differentiator from an iPhone and it's important and it costs less in some cases and therefore is, is worthy of the customer's time. That process of teaching the customer over five or 10 years is just not something that I'm good at. What I can mm -hmm. tell you though, is it's critically important. So in my projects, Clients that have that do a bad job of branding um, mm -hmm. generally have poor business results. So um, I'll give you an example. I had a uh, client who purchased a URL. Let's pretend it was candles.com. Like they, they, they sold candles. And they said to me, that they, they told me in their phone call that their sales went up and then just stopped. And they mm -hmm. can't understand why they stopped. And they had, they had a competitor, let's call it um, Kevin's Candles. OK, mm -hmm. and they, the Kevin's candles were their sales kept going up, up, up. And they wanted to know why candles.com would perform poorly. But Kevin's candles, which is harder to remember, would perform well. And as we talked about it, Kevin, the person behind Kevin's candles, had all these little branding tricks to create awareness. He had candles mm -hmm. for different events and different opportunities and different moods that the customer would have. And he was like the expert at candles. And mm -hmm. so that branding basically causes you to struggle at first because no one knows who the heck Kevin is and doesn't know, know why Kevin's an authority with candles. But eventually that becomes the reason you buy from them is because you trust Kevin, not the candle. And I had mm -hmm. the hardest time explaining that to this client because this client felt like candles.com was going to be easy to identify for the customer who's never bought from you. It'd be a destination to go to. So I do mm -hmm. know that branding is important and does generate customer loyalty over time. I'm just not good enough to come up with the ideas to help my clients with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. Got it. Uh, 
Can you tell about uh, obsolete techniques that customers, companies can use? For example, uh, I often see in SEO field when companies uh, do something that it doesn't work anymore because Google changes algorithms, uh, new things are coming. Uh, can you tell uh, from your experience, uh, do you see such things when companies are doing something that are obsolete or probably uh, don't work anymore and how to uh, find something that uh, works much better i work with a lot of companies that have um catalogs so it's a, mm -hmm. it's a catalog you thumb through it you see the item you want you go to the website you purchase the item the art of creating a catalog putting it in a mailbox and getting a customer to purchase is essentially obsolete mm -hmm. and you can tell um, over the last 20 years with my catalog clients, there are different metrics that help me see when a technique is becoming obsolete. So mm -hmm. at some point, an old marketing technique is responsible for generating the majority of your customers. So let, let's pretend that you have a company that has a 100 customers and 50 mm -hmm. of those customers buy because you do marketing activities. Mm -hmm. Okay. So 50 of the orders are going to happen anyway because the customer loves your product. 50 happen because you do different marketing activities. If you, over time, analyze those 50 orders and you see that the mix of those are starting to change, so you'll see that one marketing channel starts to degrade. Another marketing activity that has very few orders starts to increase. That's a harbinger that you are going to go down a path where one of the marketing channels is starting to die. Mm -hmm. And at a point where about, let's, we'll use the catalog example I was just talking about. If a client generated 50 orders through catalog marketing and that number falls to 30, that is a marketing channel that you are going to have to get away from eventually. Because mm -hmm. now it, I, I have found that once about 40% of the orders disappear from an old marketing channel, that marketing channel is becoming obsolete and you have to make a change pretty quick. And pretty quick, meaning mm -hmm. over the course of a few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to get out of that. Most of my catalog clients that I still have saw all that happen and ignored it. No matter, they didn't care. And now they're at a point where what what happens is you are left with only the customers who buy from the old marketing channel. And as it turns out, those customers on average tend to be old people. Mm -hmm. So the, the age of the client or age of the customer that's buying from my catalog clients is between 60 and 75 years old. So you can still generate business today, but you are generating business from a 60 to 75 year old. And what happens is when you want to um, have a search campaign for a certain product and you're trying to target the younger customer, a younger customer will see that come to your website and everything looks like it's for a 65 year old person and they bounce. And as a result, you never are able to get those customers to convert. And it will cause management to think, oh, my gosh, those customers are never going to convert. We need to focus on our core customer who's 65 years old, who is eventually going to not be with you anymore. Mm -hmm. So once you see that shift of business start to happen where, you know, you lose 25 or 35 or 40 percent of your volume from an old marketing channel, it's time to get away from that marketing channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, valuable. Yeah, love it. Uh, okay. Uh, how to find? the right marketing channel if uh, companies started from scratch. For, uh, let's imagine a new project, uh, new products, uh, high quality products. But uh, if companies don't know which channels to use, can you tell uh, from your experience how to find it? Uh, in, in the early days for a company, there are it, it, mo most of my clients in their, as they're just starting are going to probably do something in social that is going to cause mm -hmm. you to generate customers. And what you're looking for is you're, because it's going to cost you very little, you're able to get a lot of customers early and you're going to generate maybe up to two to $5 million in sales pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. At that point, you're going to now, you're, you're, you now have enough data and information about customers buying certain products that you have certain products that work really well. Those are the products that your search campaigns are going to be focusing on. Because you know that those customers, those items sell well and they were attract in, in social, they attracted a certain type of customer. So therefore, you tend to have a little more success with those customers in search. 
as you build customers and build your customer base, you will get to a point where your email marketing starts to become important. So for mm -hmm. my clients, once a customer purchases for the third time, those customers tend to like to purchase via email marketing. It may not be directly attributed to email marketing, but the message you're sending in those email campaigns causes that customer to go out into the internet and do something. So mm -hmm. I, those things just tend to layer on to each other naturally over time. And then as you approach 10 or $15 million in annual sales, you tend to find your voice as a brand. You tend to find out your, your customers are telling you why they buy from you and you know what messages work and don't work. And then you have a lot more opportunities after that. But that's that's how my clients tend to like to layer those things. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice, valuable. Uh, I'm interested, for example, uh, let's imagine you started from scratch without any experience, knowledge, skills. What will you do to learn more about uh, analytics, uh, customer development? Uh, for example, if someone want to jump on this field to be a consultant in one day, uh, to become an expert on this niche, what will you do to uh, start today from scratch? I would per personally, so this probably wouldn't be the answer everybody else would give. Um, I think it's important to build your reputation f a few years in advance of when you want to mm -hmm. become a consultant. So if you have mm -hmm. a job right now and you're making a, a reasonable living and you're happy and you eventually want to become a consultant, I would be building my reputation and be um, publishing content and showing that I'm an expert now. Um, now, it's going to be difficult because you may not have access to a lot of data. So like I have access to a ton of data and from, from mm -hmm. many companies. And so it gives me a huge advantage. When I was starting off, I knew I was going to become a consultant. I wrote two books in the two years before I started becoming a consultant. And I had written, I was writing my blog at the time as well. And I literally made up data. So I created a data set. I use random number generators to create information for me when a customer would purchase. I knew what the rules were because at the time I was working at a company called Nordstrom and it's a giant retail brand. And I knew how often customers purchased. I knew what categories they bought from. I had previously worked at a company called Eddie Bauer. They had a different business model. And I previously worked at a company called Land's End, which had another different business model. So I took those three business models I created a data set with millions of records and I used random number generators to create when a customer purchased and what they purchased based on the rules I knew. And then I used the, that data set to write my books and to write my blog content. So it mm -hmm. gave me an opportunity to share how I approach things without having data that I could use to show that I knew how to analyze things. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that you can do that today necessarily, but there has to be a parallel that allows you to show that you are a subject matter expert so that when you want to become a consultant, you are already viewed as an expert and you will have business from day one and not have to make all the compromises that people have to make early in their consulting career. It's, it's mm -hmm. very difficult early in a consulting career to reject work and say, I'm not going to work with a certain client. So if you need money, you are going to work with people that maybe you shouldn't be working with. And you want to build a reputation beforehand so that when you start your consulting practice, you have already attracted the kind of customer you want to attract. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Uh, can you tell, uh, for example, for uh, 14 years of experience, it's a lot of time. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, can you tell how it's evolving uh, consultancy? I mean, like, for example, uh, I remember when uh, 10 years ago I started Google Ads and uh, I use simple methods. Just uh, set up uh, all my marketing budget and got clicks for uh, five cent per click today it costs like five dollars per click you know so i can't use these channels without the right data without setting a buying persona because it's competitive can you tell uh, how things change in your field uh, uh for all this time you know uh, and how to adapt to new technologies uh, that are coming I, I know that for example you use one tool because i think this tool is uh, evolving as well yeah i think microsoft changes this tool you know to provide new insights features uh, can you tell how it's evolving and how to adapt fast uh, faster than your competitors so how things have evolved over the last 15 years um 
the the amount of competition that I or anybody else has today is far greater than it was 15 years ago. It is far Mm -hmm. greater than it was three years ago. So when (laughs) the pandemic started and people can work from home, I went from having, my goal is to have almost no competitors. So if I have no competitors, then I get all the business in my field. So I don't want to be competing with anybody. When the pandemic started, I went from having maybe one competitor to having 100,000 competitors because everybody Mm -hmm. was working from home and people could do whatever they wanted to do. So I'm exaggerating when I say 100,000 competitors, but that's what it feels like. So I had a lot of competitors, and as a result, my salary decreased because people were willing to pay somebody $5,000 to do something when I have something that's similar but better, but it would cost Mm $20,000. So all of a sudden, I lost a lot of business. Um, Mm -hmm. So what has happened over 15 years is the, the value that a prospective client gets from a consultant has changed. So um, 15 years ago, I could charge $40,000 for a project because there was nobody else like me because I had an expertise that other people didn't have and therefore I could charge a premium for my work. Also 15 years ago, people kind of knew you personally. So they, they, they would, I would go to a dinner at an industry event and I would talk to people and they knew who I was. Um, today, they know who you are digitally. And that is not the same as knowing you personally. So when you know a person digitally and you know another 10 people digitally, you're going to tend to go with the person who has the lowest price. And so as a consultant, you lose business today that you wouldn't have lost 15 years ago. And so you have to change your pricing. So my projects, which used to cost between $40,000 and $50,000 15 years ago, now cost, say, $25,000. I have a lot of projects that I do that are short-term, quick projects for $7,000. And I try to get three or four of those instead of one larger project. So over time, the knowing you personally versus knowing you digitally has changed how much I can charge for a project. And so... Today, a client gets far better outcomes from my work than they did 15 years ago, and they are paying a lot less than they would have paid otherwise. However, I lose a ton of projects to people who are less qualified than me, which is okay. That's just how capitalism works. And those people then, the the clients, I, I will find I have clients who go and hire people that compete with me. And then they come back to me six months later and say, we worked with this individual and we didn't get what we wanted and they come back to me. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of, in my opinion, how it changed. I have a lot more competition now and I can charge a lot less than I used to be able to charge. Um, The work, however, I would argue is more fun. Mm -hmm. So what what would have happened 15 years ago is you'd have gotten data and with the tools I had and the speed of my computer, it would literally take me four or five days to grind through data and I would be sitting and watching the machine just grind through data. Today, I load that stuff into my laptop and 90 seconds later, I have answers. And it allows me to answer a lot of questions quickly. And that is a lot more fun to be able to get answers, you know, every 90 seconds than to wait, you know, nine, you know, nine hours for an answer. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love it. Uh, I have the final question about the future. What kind of future can you predict in uh, customer development, in analytics? And uh, how uh, consultants need to be prepared today uh, to take this future? Um, I'm going to probably answer this differently than um, you anticipated. Um, So Mm -hmm. a lot of my projects are called forecasting projects. Mm -hmm. We look at a customer base and based on the customer's attributes today, I project over the next five years, how much business the company is going to generate on an annual basis for each of the next five years. That those forecasts right now are telling me that companies are going to go through a downturn, an economic downturn. So what what happens is let's pretend you have a hundred customers today and 30% of them buy again next year. So I retain 30 of them. I find 70 new customers. I'm back to 100 customers. So that's Mm -hmm. a stable business. Right now, what's happening is instead of retaining 30 customers, my clients are retaining 25 customers. 
And instead of acquiring 70 customers, they're acquiring 50 customers. So next year, they start their business with 75 customers instead of 100. And even if they do everything right, they're going to have a bad year. And so that is what I am seeing in my forecasts. And so mm -hmm. as a consultant, I have to get ahead of that curve. And I have to be telling people that this is coming and that we need to plan for it now so that two years from now, you're not left with just 50 customers instead of 100 and your business is too small and you're panicked. I don't want that. So as a consultant right now, I am working with my clients and helping them see what the future is going to look like. Even if they don't send me any data, I have a pretty good idea what is coming. And it's my job to prepare them for that. I think the job of a consultant is always to prepare leadership of your clients for what is likely to happen and get them to embrace whatever is coming and get them to make better decisions than they would have made if you didn't exist. And so I don't worry so much about what the analytics are or the methodologies are. I worry about the message that I can teach leadership so that leadership does something different. And if leadership does something different, I've been successful. Nice, nice, valuable. Love it. You know, uh, I think if uh, I was good with mathematics as you, you know, uh, I probably I started uh, my uh, uh, trading business, you know, <laughs> because to forecast this data. <laughs> Kevin, it's a big pleasure to get on the show, to learn from you. Uh, guys, please follow Kevin on his social media. By the way, uh, share which way is better to connect with you, to follow you uh, with my, from my audience. Um, probably the best thing to do is just follow, you know, just, you can connect with me on Twitter real easily. It's at mine, mm -hmm. that data, M I N E T H A T D A T A. Um, and then if you had questions about more information or my blog or whatever, I can forward it to you from there. Okay, guys, you can find, uh, links to Twitter to uh, Kevin blog in the description below. Uh, you need to follow him because you can see a lot of valuable insights. Love it, you know, yeah. Uh, you share a lot of value with us. It's a big pleasure. Thanks again, you know, for taking your time. Sure. Uh, 10 10,000 uh, monthly followers on his blog. So it's better to be one of them to get all these insights faster than your competitors. Uh, guys, you can find all these things in the description below. Listen to us on Apple, Google, Spotify, and see you next time.